And, you know, I really felt like uh, I was I, I felt like it was a good message that the Lord put on my heart. But essentially, the message had to do with the fact that that we're not a slave, but instead we're a son. I promise I'm not going to re-preach the whole message. But I believe that what the Lord wanted to communicate was the fact that in Christ now. And what does that even mean to be in Christ? But, but what it means is this, is that the first time we were born in Adam in our natural birth, and that when we get born again, we're born again in Christ. And according to the word of God, you just got to take my word on it if you haven't read it all yet. I'm here to share with you. I've read it. This is what it means. That to be in Christ means that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. And that when we by faith put our faith in what God says about that, that now the old man that we were born like Adam dies with Jesus. In the mind of God, the old man that we were born like Adam dies with Jesus on the cross, is buried with Jesus in the tomb, and a new man is resurrected to a new life. All right? And so what we preached on was the children of Israel and the fact that they were slaves in Egypt, but that God was delivering his his son Israel. That's what that's what the Lord told Moses to say in Exodus chapter 4. He said, Tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn, Israel is my son, and let my son go so that he may serve me. Praise God. God wants his people called by his name to be able to serve him. You know, uh, the Lord's been really putting it on my heart over the last year that the words that I love you are not really good enough anymore. No, really, they're not, because there's people that say that they love God, but they're not living for God and they're not serving God with everything that's in them. And the Lord wants us to serve him with our lives. Amen. He gave his life. He served us with his life. The word of God teaches and says this. Jesus said, the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to the earth to pay a ransom, yes. to, to save us yes. from the debt of sin, amen, so that we could access eternal life. And so what, one of the things that he wants us to do is to serve us from the position of a son. And not only that, I want to say this, he also wants us to have a relationship as a bride. So he wants us to, the word of God teaches that we're sons, but there, we're also the bride of Christ. And the son receives an inheritance, but the bride has access to intimacy. And it's very important that we understand that because, see, in order for us to really produce fruit for God, we have to have intimacy with God. Amen. Now, I don't know, how do you bear fruit without intimacy? You really can't bear fruit without intimacy. And you know, one of the things that I was thinking about is how can you be intimate with God? How is it that you could be intimate with God? You think about that for a moment. It's completely different than, than you know, physical relationship. But, but what I want you, but, but I just want you to think about this. How is it that you can be intimate with God? All right. Now I'm not saying that you have to start shouting it out from the rooftop. Hallelujah. But I want you to, I want you to think about how is it that you can be? Well, there's only so many ways that you can be intimate with God, right? right. I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, let's just say, let's not even talk about a romantic type of relationship, but you wanted to get to know someone better. I mean, what would you have to do if it was a friendship? You have to spend some time with that person, amen? amen. And, and you, you probably want to talk to them, kind of get to know them, right? right? Spend a little time, get to know them. And so when it comes to God, how, how would you do such a thing, right? And I think that most of y'all are already on the same page as me. And a lot of that's going to come from reading the Bible, right? And we've been talking about that, or I said it the other day, about the importance of reading the Word of God. You know, nowadays, a lot of believers, and I'm not picking on believers, I promise. I'm just, I'm not picking on the church. I'm just trying to make a point that when I first got saved back in the day, we were instructed to read the Word of God, and we did. Even if we didn't understand it, we still read it, amen? And and there's no way that you'll ever understand it if you never crack it open and read it. And so that's part of building an intimate relationship with the Lord. But I also want to tell you that there's, uh, you know, listen, you got the word of God by itself. You, you can approach the word of God in a very legalistic type way. 
And it's not the letter of the word that we're looking for. It's the spirit of the Amen. word. We're looking for the living word Amen. to have a relationship with Jesus. Amen. And what I, what I need you to know is this, is that prayer is a big part of that. Amen. But look, there's different kinds of prayer. Now, I'm not trying to tell you exactly how you need to pray. But what I do need you to understand is this, is that prayer in an intimate way, that prayer can be a very intimate time between yeah. you and the Lord. Has anybody, and listen, and you don't have to raise your hand because I'm not trying to make people feel, feel weird that maybe have never experienced this. But in your prayer time, as you've gone through your journey of Christianity, have you ever experienced moments where you really felt the presence of the Lord in your prayer time, where you really felt God touching your heart in a powerful way, where you really felt, maybe even felt a lot of emotion connected to your prayer time. Amen. Now, let me ask you this. A lot of people are saying yes, and I believe that. Probably the majority of the people in here have experienced that at some time or another. Maybe not everyone, but guess what? I was a Christian for 12 years and can say I probably really didn't experience that until the tragedy that I faced. See, it doesn't always take tragedy to get you to that place. It really doesn't. The Bible actually says that if you draw near God, then he will draw near you. See, God will reciprocate towards our movement. In other words, he will respond when we move close towards him. He will move Amen. close towards us. But I got to tell you that many times whenever people face trials in their life, when they face situations in their life, sometimes instead of going towards the Lord, they find themselves like the children of Israel want to go back towards Egypt. And the word of the Lord teaches us that that's not the way that we're supposed to go. We're not supposed to go back to the ways of old, to the old ways or the old things that we used to do, right? I mean, I could sit here and list off to you all the things that I used to do, but I'm sure you have your own list of things, okay? And what, we're, but what we should learn to do is, is that in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the tribulation, that we would seek God in those moments, and that we would grab a hold of the Lord, and that whenever we would grab a hold of the Lord, many times we learn how to pray. Listen, have you ever been in the midst of being so jammed up that you felt like you were stuck and that you didn't know how you were in a, it was something that you couldn't fix. It was something that you couldn't control. And what are you going to do? I don't know what to do. Sometimes, you know what, you know what I find lately is sometimes if I'm not careful, I'll catch myself talking about it. Oh, I'll call Dave up, and I'm like, Dave, I don't even know what to tell you, man. Blah, blah, blah. I'll call Bill up. Oh, dude, da, 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 da. I'll call up Sabrina. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, Danielle, let me tell you. And you know what I noticed is the more I talk about it, the more frustrated I get. Yes, sir. Yes. Every single time I get into a conversation with someone else about it, the more frustrated and aggravated I get. But if I learn to come, and, and this is why I like to pray right now, but I did. I put put a little blanket in my closet where, where I've been praying. Danielle said, Danielle. Today she's looking for the dog and she found the dog in my like, looking at me like, what are you doing in my prayer closet? But what I'm trying to say is this is that one of the things that I've learned in the midst of some real in the rough times is that I learned how to pray in rough times. And nobody ever, I never really learned how to pray. And that's probably my own fault because I never really I had the opportunity to be around people that knew how to pray, but I don't think I availed myself to that. But when I really, really needed God. And nothing else was working. See, I tried to go back to the Egyptian stuff. I tried to go back to the old way of life. You know, uh, even the song was saying, we don't want anything but you. Hallelujah. Open up, the, we don't want anything but you. Well how, well, how can you say that? No, really, in that song, how, come on, dude. How can you say that? You say you don't want anything but God. Probably because he tried everything that he did. Yeah. Right? And nothing worked. And he came to the realization that he, that he doesn't want anything else but God. Amen. And I just want to encourage you. We're talking a little bit about intimacy right now. That, that it's in those rough times. It's in those tough times that if you'll get along with the Lord and you'll just bear your heart to him. And it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, if you will go to the Lord and get along with God, I suggest you get along with God. It's great to pray with your wife. It's great to pray with your husband. It's great to pray with your children. But there's nothing like getting along with the Lord, especially before there's even anybody awake, or go in your room and lock the door and get on your knees or lay on the floor, however you want to do it, and just begin to cry out from your heart what's going on in your life. I'm telling you, don't, don't give me a... Oh, no, I can't do that because 
Because I'm a man. Guess what, brother? Guess what, sister? David, hallelujah, the psalmist, he wrote so many psalms. I don't even know how many psalms he wrote. But at the same time, he was a warrior. He was a warrior king. There wasn't no man better than David with all the other men. I like Solomon told me this. I got to give him credit. He said one of the first times he, when he preached in Russia, he said he walked in there. He didn't expect there to be that many people. There was over 2,000 people. He said, my knees started fellowship. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. All the men of Israel, their knees were fellowshipping with one another. They were cowering in the camp for 40 days as Goliath would come up, cast his shadow over the valley Elah and say, come on and send me a warrior over here and if he takes me down, we'll be your slave. If I take him down, you'll be our slave. And here's young David coming off the shepherd, coming out of the shepherd's field, writing psalms to the Lord. He doesn't kill the lion. He doesn't kill the bear. And he shows up and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now I preached on circumcision. I was going to talk about it again in my notes. Because it was a sign of the covenant. That's what David's saying. How dare we sit around cowering in this camp whenever he is not even in covenant with God? Just like Joshua and Caleb when they walked into the land. And, they, and then and the other ten said, oh, we're like grasshoppers in the eyes of the giant. Joshua said, they're bread for us. <laughs> See, there's something whenever you and I, whether we're a man, whether we're a woman, whether we're a child, whether we're an old person. If we can learn the secret of grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar. That's what it was called about in the Old Testament. Grab a hold of the horns of the altar. Get into that intimate place and experience the presence of God. I'm telling you something. It'll be a changer in your life. And we need to learn how to have a renewed mind that begins to think that way. And so a son, the thought of a son's relationship to his father is connected to inheritance. I've got good news for you. There's an inheritance waiting for you. There's an inheritance waiting for you on the other side. Listen to me. If you didn't read the book, you got to just trust me right now. I got to tell you, there's an inheritance waiting for you on the other side of glory. Praise God. There's a day coming. It's called the millennial reign of Christ. And, and guess what? You're going to be receive a reward of eternal life. But listen to me. They're just like the parable of the talents talked about. See, the, set, the, the Bible teaches that there, was a, that there was a man going on a journey. And he said, listen, I'm going to give you five talents. It was money. Okay, just trust me with this. It's money. I'm going to give you five pieces of money. I'm going to give you three pieces of money. I'm going to give you one piece of money. And, I'm, and I want you to abide or occupy. And I want you to, to I, want, I want an increase is what I want on my money. I'm expecting to get an increase when I come back. And I'm going on a journey and I'm going to come back. And he goes on a journey. And then he comes back and now he comes to settle accounts. And the one that had five gave him back ten. The one that had three gave him back six. But the one that had one said, oh, I was fearful because you're a shrewd man. So I dug a hole and I stuck it in the ground. See, and what the Lord said to the one that had five and turned it into ten and three that turned it into six. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in small things. Now enter into your rest and be a ruler over many things. You see, your life that you live today will affect your eternity tomorrow. I need you to understand that. See, I wouldn't be a good preacher if I didn't tell you that. See, there's something called the judgment seat of Christ, and I know I've talked about it here recently, but what we do in this life, it's not good enough just to make it in, Christian. You want to do more than making it in. You want to have an intimate relationship with the Lord, and you want to understand what it means to be a son, because you want to be able to you want to be able to experience the inheritance that God has for you. But I gotta tell you something. There's an inheritance waiting for us today. As a son of God, the Lord wants to give us back what the enemy stole through Adam, and he wants the glory of God to work on operate on the inside of us, and he wants to give us power and authority to walk upon the earth today. Power and authority to where we don't have to be slaves in Egypt anymore, and we can walk out and live a life of victory to bring hope to a lost and a dying world. Yes. Amen. There's people out there that need hope. Yes. Amen. Yes. So how do you bear fruit without intimacy? You know, and I was thinking about Romans 7, 4. It says you're dead to the law by the body of Christ. Why? So that you might be married to another. Amen. See, we died to sin in Romans chapter 6 and we died to the law in Romans chapter 7. We're not supposed to approach Christianity through a bunch of rules and regulations. That's right. 
Amen. We're supposed to have a living and an, opera, an operational life in Christ that's being energized by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. And he says this right here. He says, even to him that is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit from God, fruit from God. That we, he says that we, we, we were dead to the law by the body of Christ that we might be married to another. We died to sin and we died to the law so that we could be married to another. And in salvation, we're married to Jesus. And whenever we're now, we're married to Jesus and we walk with him. We bear fruit for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So there's times like we were talking about where the enemy wants you to feel hopeless. And there's a layer to the word that it can become legalistic, right? Knowledge can puff up. That's, right. That's what the word of God says. And it's stated, in, that's stated in the love chapter. Amen. Head knowledge isn't the same as heart knowledge. That's right. To know Jesus with one's heart, that is intimacy. Satan wants you to feel hopeless when you're going through pain. And at that moment, he will try to attack you harder because he doesn't want you to take that next step. He doesn't want you to find out what lies right on the other side. He wants you to start to feel hopeless and feel despair and to lay there by yourself and to constantly think about it and talk about it and feel miserable and feel hopeless. He doesn't want you to tap into that opportunity where you're like, you know what, you lying devil. I remember what that preacher said. I'm going in my room and I'm going to lock the door and I'm going to seek the face of God. And you see if the Lord don't show up. Amen. And you're going to go ahead and give him a little bit more time than what you expected if he doesn't show up right whenever you want him to. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He doesn't want you to know that next step to take. What's the next step? You cry. How does one become intimate with the Lord? Prayer, reading, fasting. I'm not trying to talk about turning this stuff into a law, my friend. I've got Brother James Cheney coming up pretty soon. He's been in Kenya. And, uh, and he, wanted, he wanted an opportunity to come talk to the church. I'm excited about that. And, I, and he, said, he said over there, man, he said there's one pastor that's teaching people to fast to the point where they put 540 people in a grave. They, 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 that, now that's, that's, that's some sick stuff. Amen. We ain't trying to fast like that because you ain't trying to earn nothing. But let me tell you something. There's power to fast. And I told him on the phone, I'm like, brother, we ain't trying to fast like that, but we fast or at least fast the magnal fast because Nehemiah fasted, Jesus fasted. Come on. Hallelujah. Elijah fasted. They fasted because they fasted to seek God, to get a hold of God, to get a hold and to get a word from the Lord. Amen. To make a connection to God. I want to make a connection with you, Lord. Repentance and turning from sin. Dude, that's a big deal. You want intimacy with the Lord? We need to repent and we need to turn from sin. We're not talking about earning. We're talking about seeking. Amen. Intimacy will give us a desire to serve him from a heart of love instead of obligation. And when we serve him, we glorify his name. We go where he tells us to go. We do what he tells us to do. Say what he tells us to say. And we bring glory to his name. We preach the kingdom of God to a lost world and help them realize there is an eternal life and an inheritance to gain. God wants his people to serve him. Amen. I can't repeat it enough times. And when we, when we just say that we love God, it, it just, it's just, I think it's just starting to, it's starting to fall on deaf ears. Or at least that's what I feel like the Lord's showing me. They say they love me. And I was thinking, I might have even said this Sunday, but I had a conversation with a guy today. And I was like, you know, I think I said this Sunday. You can see some of these videos. And listen, I'm not trying to call people into question because you don't know everybody's heart. And I get that. But you see people will be in a worship service and they got their hands lifted and they're worshiping the Lord. And they might even have tears streaming down their eyes. But what's going to happen when you begin to talk to them about repentance and about turning away from sin? Are they going to get so offended that they don't want to hear what it is that you have to say? And, and, and I think that a lot of times in the church world that we're living in, people can't handle to hear whenever they're told that their life is headed in the wrong direction. They don't want to hear all that. And they'll say that that's not the love of God. God, but I beg to differ. That is the love of God. Yes, it is. It's the truth of God. Yes, it and God's truth is love. Yes. Amen? Amen. But one of the highlights of the past, the message that I preached was that story about Zipporah. <laughs> and, you know, I've read that many times and I've studied it, but I don't think I've ever preached it out loud like that. But then the Lord gave it to me on how to preach it, right? 
I asked that girl at the hospital. Well, I'm not gonna say that. But but but, but what I, but what I want you to know is this: is that what I imagined in my mind was that she's holding that boy. He's probably about five years old, and she's holding him, and she had to cut the foreskin off because you see. The, again, the circumcision was a type of covenant with God. And God was about to destroy the firstborn of Egypt and about to save his firstborn Israel. And I got to tell you something, church, that I got to tell you that that judgment is going is coming upon the earth. It's coming and it's time for God's people to get their hearts Right with God. Amen. And that's what she did. You remember that story? And I just thought it was such a good little typology where she ends up. Moses makes her cut it off. And I know it's kind of gross, but he makes her cut it off. And then she throws it at the feet of Moses. And she says, you're a bloody husband unto me because of the circumcision. And I couldn't help but think about Romans chapter 2 verse 29 and how the Lord wants to circumcise our hearts. And how he wants to do a work on the inside of our hearts. And that many times whenever the Lord's dealing with us about things in our life that we don't want to let go of. But yet he's been trying to convict us about it. It's almost like we're like that. Where we're fighting against it and we become angry. And it's like we take the foreskin that it cuts off our heart finally. And we just like throw it at his feet. And we're like, look, when you're a bloody husband to me. Look what you made me do. You made me die to self. You made me crucify the flesh. It really doesn't turn out that way, though. Can I be honest with you? Usually whenever you let the Lord crucify the flesh in your heart, you finally feel the freedom. Yeah. Yes. You realize you were fighting against him. You realize you were irritated with him. But then once you release it and let it go, oh, man, it's such a, it's such a beautiful thing. Amen? Amen? There's another place I said last time, Galatians 5.24, that, that, that those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. Amen. As his bride, we can't have intimacy with him and at the same time intimacy with another. Let me say that one more time. As his bride, we can't have intimacy with him and at the same time be in an intimate relationship with another. In other words, if the word of the Lord says that something is sin, then it's sin. And if we're engaging in a relationship with that at the same time, we're trying to engage in a relationship with the Lord. It doesn't work that way. Ongoing Christianity is marked in a large way by this truth that those that belong to Christ are in the process continuously of allowing him to crucify their flesh. But many people, many times people don't want that. They're, they're, and, and many times people are willing to lead a double life. I feel like it's important that we get this stuff out in church. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we start moving in this direction because let me tell you something. I feel like the days are short. Yeah. Yes. I feel like the days are short. I feel like we need to talk about the hard things. And maybe there's other hope and pray that other preachers are also that the Lord's moving on their heart to start talking about these things. But if we get our heart right with the Lord and we let him start working, we will see that intimate relationship that we need. And we can start work walking as the bride of Christ with a love and an intimate love for him. And also walking as sons, walking in our inheritance, walking in our authority and seeing us begin to desire to tell people about the goodness of God. God's doing a work in people's hearts in this church. I know that. I know for a fact he's doing a work in people's hearts. And he's making them hungry. Yeah. He's making them hungry to go and to minister to people. Yes. And to tell people about the goodness of Jesus. Yeah. And I'd rather have however many people we have in here right now. That, and people that are getting on fire for the Lord. And people that want to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Than to have every seat packed out with nothing but a bunch of troublemakers. I'm just being real. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it, yeah, I don't need to be, if the troublemakers are going to let the Lord get a hold of them, hallelujah, bring them in. But if they're just going to sit here for the rest of their life and cause trouble, come on. Either that or we'll let one of y'all be the pastor because I ain't down with it. No, that's not true. That's not true. The Lord called me to be pastor and I'm going to stick it out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We'll let him, we'll let him decide who stays. <laughs> I feel like that's a circumcision of my heart. I'm sorry, Lord. Praise God. Can't have a little bit of the world, a little bit of a little bit of uh, a little bit of the world, a little bit of the Lord. Can't have a little bit of scripture, a little bit of sin. Can't have a little bit of uh, of this and a little bit of that. What's the big deal, right? Well, the Word of God says that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump, and a little bit of unfaithful to God and His Word is actually cheating, right? 
As the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness continue to dwell on the earth, there will be real prophets of God and there will also be false prophets of God. Now, I can tell you that if you read in the scripture that many times the prophets of the Lord in the Old Testament, they did. They predicted the future. Amen. And, and in the Old Testament, you better get it right. <laughs> right. But, but, but nevertheless, I want you to know it wasn't just that. That's not all they did, though. As a matter of fact, more times than not, they weren't just predicting future. The future. They were telling the truth. They were forth telling the word of the living God and bringing the word of correction to the people of God so that they would have an opportunity to get their hearts and their lives right. A true prophet of God is going to tell the truth. Yeah. And he will not manipulate God's word in a way, in an attempt to manipulate God's people. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to just share with you, Haley, if you could put this scripture up on the board. We'll give her a little time. If you got your Bible, you could turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I'm in the King James Version of the Bible. And uh, the Lord had kind of put this on my heart the other day. And uh, I kind of shared a little bit of this at the jail today. That went good, too. I'm still trying to get some other people in there. But anyway, it says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And I, I, want, you, I want us to focus on, on this scripture here. Hereby know ye the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, I've had a conversation recently with someone who, you know, operates more in deliverance ministry than I have. And what this person has found is that whenever you're casting out devils, that whenever if one of the ways that you can find out is you ask them, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And this person made the comment that if if there's still something going on in there, they won't say it that they, they'll, they'll, and, and they can't say it. Whereas, whereas if, if, if they're clean, right, then, then they can come out and they can say it. And I, and I have no reason not to believe that. I have no reason. But, but I do want you to know this, that there's something a little bit deeper going on here, right? And I want you to know about context. Because, see, John was, was dealing with something. I almost don't feel like dr drawing on this board. It's so pretty and clean. Uh, but John was, was dealing with something called Gnosticism. Now, the word not, not gnosis is where you get the word information, so it had to do with a specific type of knowledge. Now, this goes all the way back. I'm not trying to get weird on you, but this goes all the way back. Anybody that's heard about the Illuminati, now that stuff been around forever. The word Illuminati describes a special kind of knowledge, and it's all connected, connected to mystery Babylon and the mystery religions. Because all mystery religions are connected to a certain type of superior knowledge. All right. So this stuff was going on all the way back in the garden. The serpent told Eve, in the day that you eat thereof, surely you will not die, but instead you will know being knowledge and you will become as gods. But in, during, the, during the first century church, John, the beloved, is dealing with something called Gnosticism, where the same lying spirit that was in the garden has now moved into the church age. And what they're trying, that what they've done is they've taken the newfound concept of Jesus and they've added it to their belief system. But what they believed is this: they believed that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. They believed that that Jesus, that it wasn't the real Jesus that died. And the Islam kind of teaches something similar. It's a weird thing. They feel like the the real Jesus didn't go on the cross. It was in somebody else named Jesus. A bunch of weird stuff. Any any kind of false doctrine is going to come against the deity of the Lord. It's going to also come against His sacrifice. All right. But this is the point I'm trying to make is that they believe that what Jesus did, they believe they said that they believed in the Jesus. But what Jesus did was he renewed their spirit. But because he didn't come in the flesh, they didn't believe that the flesh had to be redeemed. So basically what that meant was is that they could still live a sinful life in the flesh, but that they would be OK. So some of that stuff still goes on in the church today where people are under delusion. 
And they believe that they can live a double life and they believe that they can live a life of sin and they believe that, 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 that they're going to be okay. But in reality, what has happened is, is that when we live in a perpetual life of sin, what ends up taking place is that our conscience becomes seared to the Holy Spirit. Anybody that's honest in this place, if you've lived, uh, people that have been living for the Lord for any length of time anyway, have found themselves probably in a place in their walk with God where they opened up doors to sin and after a period of time, their conscience becomes seared to it and you'll actually almost think like you might be okay yeah. Yeah. when in reality, you're not okay. Amen. And so, John's saying that every... Hereby you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. See, there's going to be a real Antichrist that's going to come, and the Scripture teaches us that there's already been many Antichrists, but there's been a spirit of Antichrist, actually that's the spirit of Antichrist that was in Satan in the garden. It's been on the earth. Okay, and we can get into it a little bit deeper, but I'm just trying to stay focused on this passage. And then he says this, verse 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, those that are operating in the spirit of Antichrist, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm trying to make a point here because I feel like God gave me a little bit more clarity on this passage of Scripture than what I had previously. All right? And look at this in verse 5. They are of the world. Who's they? Those that don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. Now listen, if we were going to talk to somebody that was in the church today and you asked them, did Jesus come in the flesh? They're going to tell you, of course Jesus came in the flesh. But I want you to look at the spiritual principle behind it. The idea here, if you could say that these people did not want their flesh to be crucified. They wanted to be able to live any way they wanted to in the flesh and still believe that they were renewed in the spirit. You understand what I'm getting at? I still want to be able to live my double life. Don't tell me that my flesh has to be crucified. And what I'm trying to tell you is that that spirit is still alive. And I believe that it's at work in the church today. They who are of that, who preachers, Lord, help the preacher. If he won't preach on sin and he won't tell the truth, Lord, help him. Because it's going to be an ugly, ugly encounter between him and the Lord. Lord, please get a hold of his heart. And I mean that with all sincerity. You do not want to be the preacher that didn't do, that did not present God's word for the way that you were supposed to do it. Especially if you had an actual call on your life. Yeah. Oh, Lord, help us. And, and, and he said, they are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world. And the world hears them. See, whenever we are in the midst of a church that, that waters down the gospel and speaks things that sound good to the tickle, to the ear, pleasant words to the ear, they, they're still in the world. Many people are sitting in churches and they're not saved. Are you saved tonight? Listen, if you've never been saved, I know I did it last Sunday. I'll probably do it every Sunday, every service from now on. Dude, you can, we can stop now. Come on, everybody lift your hands up in the air. Come on, everybody lift your hands. Come on, say it. Just close your eyes and say it. Say, Jesus. Jesus. I need you. I need you. Come into my heart, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. I invite you in. Send your spirit, Lord. Oh, change me. Teach me. Show me your ways, oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, it doesn't have to be a magical prayer, but you need to call on the name of Jesus, my friend. You need to ask Jesus into your heart. You need to ask forgiveness. And, and he said, and, but there are the world, those that don't want to hear the truth of the gospel, maybe they're not saved. Maybe there's people sitting in churches that aren't saved. No, there are. <laughs> and maybe that's why, look, look what it says in verse 6. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He ain't just talking about him, John. He's talking about all the true disciples that will come after him. All true prophets that will come after him. All true teachers. We are of God and he that knows God will hear the true prophets. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So guess what? I, I mean, listen, y'all pray for me that I'll preach the truth 
I'll pray to the Lord that he'll continue to reveal truth to me. Amen. Amen. And now, and from now on, I won't get so upset that people get up and walk out and don't want to come back. <laughs> Amen. I just won't, I just won't get upset no more because maybe either number one, it just didn't like my preaching and that's okay too, because this is America or, or number two, uh, maybe they, they can't hear what they, what they need to hear because they're not of us. Maybe that could be what it is, right? In order to properly understand, all right, we already went through that. We went through the Gnostic stuff. And look, John 6 says, John 6 says you, that my flesh is true meat and my blood is true drink. Yeah. You know, spiritually speaking, he said the flesh prophets nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. That's right. And, and, you know, I'm just thinking that if we eat his flesh, I'm talking spiritually. Amen. If we eat the flesh of Jesus, then we're going to die like he died. If we drink the blood of Jesus, I'm talking about spiritually. I know it just even sounds weird to hear it. One time me and Aaron, I don't know if Aaron remembers or not, but it was late. We went to Bourbon Street with Lance Rowe. We were Lance was carrying the cross. We were out there and went to see Jesus. Miss Sue. <laughs> Aaron would have noticed oh, that anyway. We were out there witnessing Jesus on Bourbon Street. Lance had that big old cross. We were passing out tracts telling people about Jesus. I told y'all that story before. One dude says, hey, he slapped me in the face and he said, you need to come over to the winning side. But he ran, he ran back real fast. People were spitting on lands. Oh, it was a mess. And anyway, at the end, we were, we were leaving, and there was a guy selling hot dogs at the Lucky Dog stand. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning. Street sweepers were coming through. He said, well, you know that there's a vampiric cult in town because of your Lord's words. And I said, no, sir, it ain't because of my Lord's words. It's because they listened to the words of a liar instead of the word of the Lord. Because the Lord said that the, the flesh profits nothing, but it's the spirit that brings life. They're misinterpreting it on purpose because they, they want to listen to the liar instead of the truth. So it might sound weird to hear, but I'm just trying to tell you, he's talking spiritually. He's talking about eating the truth of what his flesh came to do. He's talking about drinking the truth of what his blood came to do. And he died for us. And when we consume that spiritually and live that way that we also the old man born of Adam dies spiritually so to speak and we gain new life in Christ just as he was buried in the tomb we were buried in the tomb just as he was resurrected to newness of life we are resurrected to newness of life amen that's a process of growing up in Christ amen yes it has to take place in all believers. And sometimes, though, believers, people that sit in churches get easily offended. Y'all yeah. know that, right? Yeah. And they'll uproot themselves. And they keep uprooting themselves. And they never really get to get roots in the ground. And instead of growing up into a son, they remain a slave. Yeah. You know, sometimes God's children, God's people will literally act like a child that has been offended on the playground. Yeah. <laughs> but you're kind of harsh. I'm just telling you, man. They'll act like a child. I don't want to play with you anymore. Yeah. I don't like, I don't, I don't want to play here anymore. I'm going home. I'm going to call my mom up and come get me. I'm going a little too far. God help us. No, really, think about this now. Help. Come on, church. What are we going to do if real persecution hits us? And we can't even handle a little bit of the, the, the preacher preaching a little bit of the truth. Come on. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says this. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I want to grow up. I want to grow up in Christ. Amen. Amen. So there's a process of growth. Amen. I, uh, I, I shared some of this passage of scripture uh, Sunday, but it was at the very end. And we kind of had to rush through it. Go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Because we're talking about growing up into sonship, okay? Growing up into being a son. Because, look, the scripture says that the son said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. And then Jesus told us what we had to do to be born again. And then John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, these are scriptures I use uh, Sunday, that what manner of love is this that the Father has given, laid upon us or bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of of God right. and that the scripture teaches in Romans chapter 8 verse 17 that we've received an inheritance if we're children then children of God and heirs of God and, and joint heirs with Christ and, and, and an heir receives an inheritance and so the scripture plainly states that there's a level of being a son but look what it says in Galatians it says now I say that the heir as long as he is a child differs nothing 
The New King James says a slave, though he's Lord of all. Now, there's a little bit deeper context here, but I don't want to get in all that right now. I just want to kind of like read it on face value because there's truth in our spiritual walk that there's a growth process that has to take place. Right. And you can be an heir of God and you can be a son of God. But if spiritually you're still drinking milk and listen, there's a time and a place for everything. New new converts. The Bible says to desire the pure milk of the word. That's actually a little bit of a different context. If you read the letter that Peter wrote, he says, crave the milk, crave the sincere milk of the word. It's good to crave the word of God like a baby craves milk. That's not Peter wrote that. Paul wrote the other thing in Corinthians. The two are not exactly the same. You were to crave the word of God the, like a baby needs milk to grow. Every child of God needs the word of God to grow. But what Paul was saying is he was using the milk of the word in a different sense. He was saying by now you ought to be a teacher and you ought to be eating meat. But instead, I got to give you milk. Because you haven't grown up yet. And that's the same concept that a child, okay, and until he begins to grow up in the faith, then, then in reality, he's nothing different than a slave. Even though he has access to all this power, even though he has access to victory because Jesus purchased it for him, but he remains under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. There's a, there's a lot that we could say about that because it really, Paul's kind of talking about the law, right? And how the law was a tutor to Israel to bring them to a certain place where they could come to Jesus. And, but we're, we're not going to break it down at that level right now, okay? We're just going to kind of read it where we added this. He says, even so, we were children when we were un, in bondage under the elements of the world. And really and truly the word elements, I brought this out last time, but it describes what people were connected to in the past. The Gentile nations were under pagan false gods and the Jews were under the law. What did you used to be under when you were in the world? What was the bondage that you were under? What was the truth or what you thought was the truth that you lived your life under? See, that's what you used to be under. But now that you're in Christ, you're not under that anymore. So you're supposed to come out from under that. You're supposed to grow up, okay, in, in the fullness of, of Christ. And that's what it says right here. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. Amen. So whether, listen, you can go to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. So, look, whether it's a son or a bride, both must know what their father or husband desires, right? Whether you're a son, you, if you're a son, you need to know what your father desires, right? If you're a bride, you need to know what your husband desires. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, if you want to stay married, it means that, you know, I mean, you know what I'm getting at. I mean, because, I mean, a bride... Theoretically, I mean, it should be both ways. I'm just, just bear with me, women. <laughs> okay, I know you need to find a husband that will love you like Jesus loved the church, and I agree 100. percent Okay, so let's pray for the men right now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But for the sake of the illustration, just work with me. All right. So if you're bride, you need to know what you're. Especially now, we're talking about the bride of Christ. So as the bride of Christ, you need to know what your husband wants, right? Because you don't want to get divorced. <laughs> Right? And as a son, you need to know what your father wants. Why? Because you don't want to get disinherited. That's right. Amen? Amen. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. So look, I'm, and I'll make it a little bit of a transition here. And I want you to just work with it because we're almost done for tonight with the scriptures. Amen? But look, the word of God says that you're a son. But many times, the Word of God says you're a son. The Word of God says you're a new creation in Christ. The Word of God says old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Word of God says you're more than a conqueror through Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. The Word of God says that the old man that you were was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live, yet not you, but Christ lives through you. That's what the Word of God says. Amen. The Word of God says that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus Amen. has set you free from the law of sin yes. and death. The Word of God says that those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. All that is the truth of God's Word. But sometimes it takes a period of time for our brain to get wrapped around that to where we will believe the truth of God's Word instead of believing the lies of the enemy. 
What's going to happen tomorrow if you go back to school and the same person that said something kind of goofy today says it again tomorrow? What's going to happen when you go to work and people are coming against you and they're saying various things about what's going to happen whenever people that you're close to are telling you one thing when the word of God says something different? What's going to happen when the enemy's trying to attack you? How will you know to believe and to hold on to God? And I'm trying to tell you that the Lord wants you and I to know the word of God and for us to reorder our life according to his word and not according to the way we feel, not according to the way other people are talking about us, not according to those things, but instead that we would reorder our life according to the way the word of God is, is written. Amen. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, and I'm going to share a little bit with you. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Let me break that down for you a little bit. I don't know what your translation says, but that word provocation, it's a fancy way to say provoke. What he's saying is, don't harden your hearts as they did in the wilderness when they provoked me and in the, in the day that they tempted me. Look what he says in verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, <laughs> and saw my works for 40 years. Look at it. God saying, hey, your fathers put me to the test. You know how many scriptures say that the Lord is going to prove you and put the trial on you to, to, to test you? The scriptures are full of that. That there's a testing, the trial of your faith, though much more precious than gold, that it would be refined in the fire and that it come forth, amen, to, to, to bring glory to God. I'm paraphrasing, okay? But the, but the point is this, is that it, it, the children of Israel tempted God. They provoked him. His word says that he was grieved with that generation, that they had actually seen the works that he had done but yet they tempted him and they put him to the test and said, and then, and then he says this, I was grieved, verse 10, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and have not known my ways. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the scripture, oftentimes I'll ask questions. And one of the questions that I asked one of the first times the Lord really had me focus on this scripture is, why, Lord? Why in that last phrase did they not know your ways? Now, I don't know if you're going to come up with the same conclusion. I don't, he doesn't really say it right here, but the context is they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Okay, but where were they for the previous hundreds of years? They were slaves in Egypt. Why they didn't know your ways, Lord? Because they had been living like slaves in a the world. Their mind had been enculturated to a system of slavery and a system of the world. They didn't really know who they were. And other than that they knew that they had heard a story that they served the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they didn't know where he was. Where is this God? In the midst of our affliction, we cry out and we don't get anything in response. And what I'm trying to say to you is this, is that many times people, when we come into the house of God, we've been slaves in the world for a period of time. And when we've been slaves in the world and we have not learned the truth of God's word, we become enculturated. We've become enculturated in the world, right? Listen, I shared this story many times, but I'm just going to share it again. You know, my everybody's got their own story. Yes. I know some of your stories a little bit better than I know other people's stories, but for sake of time, I'm just going to remind you of my story. I mean, my mama grew up, they lived in Lake Arthur. Her daddy was a sheriff. And I'm just telling you what their family did. He, Grandpa drank Scotch whiskey on the rocks, and they would and they and they played boobre all night long, and they played dominoes, and they played like till two, three o'clock in the morning. And then she married my dad, and he was like an old ballroom brawler and a drinker, and so he was the loudest one at the table. They had about twelve to fifteen of them, 
uh, over there playing boot rake till three o'clock in the morning, drinking and, and getting loud and, 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 and fussing and laughing. And, and that's just what they did. And then the next morning he cooked a bunch of, he said, let's go to Adam Broussard's store boy. And he took me along with him and he bought a bunch of fryers. I don't know why they call them that, but it was whole chickens and he cut them all up. He'd lay them out on the barbecue pit and he'd just cook them like that. And, and that was, that was their life. And, and I grew up in the midst of that, learning that lifestyle. They were good, they were good people, they were nice people, they had a lot of funny jokes, and they joked around, and, and, and you know, they meant well. But there wasn't no talk about Jesus at the table. And if anything, it would have been just religion, that's just reality. And so you get enculturated, and then you grow up a little bit, and then you go to junior high, and next thing you know, you start hanging around with certain people, right? And they live their lives a certain way, and, you know, everybody starts to do a little bit of stuff that they ain't supposed to do, and you start getting interested in girls, and then you start opening up doors to messing around with girls, or girls messing around with boys, and, oh, Lord, now we're going to really start us in trouble because we're adding new stuff to the mixture. And then we get a little bit older and now people are starting to party a little bit. And you get out there and you start opening up those doors. And you're being enculturated to the ways of the world. And it's starting to affect your mind and the way that you think. And the way that you navigate your life. And Lord, help, however long we might live our lives before we actually get saved, we've been enculturated. And then once we get saved, and you'll know it if you're truly saved. I'm, listen, I'm all about getting people to pray prayers. I've done overcorrected myself to the point where I ain't even praying nobody with no prayer with nobody because half the time it ain't even real. But you know what? No. Pray, pray, try to pray people through a prayer of salvation. It's seeds being planted in their heart. The Lord knows how to make it stick. But just because you pray a prayer don't mean that I because you got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. But when you happen, Ephesians 1.13 says something, you get a down payment from the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit moves in your heart, your life will never be the same. And you might try to run, but you can't run far enough where he won't find you. He'll know exactly where you are every second of every day. And he'll keep calling your name. He'll be knocking. He'll be knocking on the door. And he'll say, come on back, girl. Come on back, boy. You can't hide from me. Amen. That's how the Lord is. He's good like that. Amen. But we've been enculturated. And so now we've got a whole lot of work to do, my friend. What you talking about? We've got to get up in this book. And we've got to let the Lord re-enculturate us. My, my people, do, they, they did always err, for they did not know my ways. How are we going to learn the ways of the Lord? We've got to get into the Word of God. We got to get into the Word of God, and we got to let the Holy Spirit deal with our hearts. Because listen, I don't mean we got some young, a couple of young people in here. I can't wait till we get y'all a youth group. I don't know that you're gonna. I hope you get. I hope you come with your A game night. They listening tonight. They've been listening to the last couple of services. They're trying to hide from it, but I know they listening. And so they get some meat. They get some meat on the bone. But look, nowadays, uh oh, because you know Pastor and I got to step on so everybody's toes before we over with through the night. So here we go. Y'all ready? Nowadays, you add to it the games. Come on. Uh-oh. So, what was that game? Me and you went to go pray for that poor girl. She was demon-possessed that time. A long time. We didn't really know what we were doing. We didn't have to take authority over that thing, did we? What was the name of that demon? Uh, Lil Weezy. What's his real name? Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne. Lil, Wayne. Lil Weezy. She was over there listening to that, and they were playing Grand Theft Auto. Poor little kids over there playing Grand Theft Auto. And I don't remember what, there was one scene where the kid, where the, the thing in Grand Theft is smoking a bong and everything else. It's like, Lord, what is going on? You're letting your child in a diaper play Grand Theft Auto. Oh, Lord, being enculturated by the wickedness of the world. And want to know why we ain't got no peace in our life. Want to know why? Why we why we can't even get connected to the things of God? No, we ought to take those electronic devices and we ought to throw them away. Is what we ought to do. And that's good. Yeah. That's good. Get the kids riled up. Because let me tell you something. You go to Mexico and you minister, and them little kids over there are so innocent. They come walking up to you. Look what I got. They can't speak English, but it's a little top with a string. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at it. Look at that top spit on the ground. They're innocent. They haven't been tainted by the ways of the world. 
Oh, you're just mean. You don't want kids to have fun. Man, I don't want people to have fun. I don't want people to go to hell. Amen. I don't want people to go to hell. Well, you think I'm going to go to hell for playing a game? You keep playing them games, and you keep letting them lies get into your heart. You keep letting the devil grab a hold of your heart, whether it's through games or whatever it is. And you see where he leads you, my friend. He ain't going to lead you nowhere where you want to end up. I can promise you that. Because he's not your friend. And the ways of the world is wickedness. That's the truth right there. Amen. It don't feel good sometimes. Felt good to me because I ain't never played a game because I was never good at it. If you're good at playing games, you probably didn't like that. You're, you know what, though? Let me just tell you young people something. Y'all not going to make a million dollars like that little kid that they told me about at the clinic. They all trying to get, they all trying to get their million dollars. Got their little headsets on with their little cameras. Oh, I'm going to get good at this. I'm going to make my, you ain't going to make your million dollars. And if you do, you're going to really be jacked up by the time you're done because you had to play that game so many times. Anyway, uh, enough on the game. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. So we're talking about a renewed mind. We're talking about being reinculturated by the Word of God. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man... Now, the word conversation is kind of outdated. Now it means your life. That you put off your old life. Okay? That you put off concerning your old life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I was reading that one time after the Lord had gotten a hold of me, I got a major revelation, I felt like. And the revelation that I got was this. That what the renewed mind is, it's the mind that understands he's a new man in Christ. That's right, that's good. It's, and, and listen, it comes through the word, but it's not just by how much, I'm going to read five chapters a day, no, but it's, the, it's understanding to, to know the word of God in the way that it was written to teach you that you were born an old way but you've been born again and now you're a new creation. Yes. And that when you see the word of God through that, see the word of God begins to reinculturate you. It begins to wash your mind and it begins to reveal to you the truths of God's word. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And then we're going to close. Singers, musicians, y'all can come up. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think I used this scripture recently, but let me just tell you again. The word conformed means to be fashioned like unto. So if you're being conformed to the world, it means you're allowing the world to fashion you. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, I'll pick on music, too. And look, we can pick on music. We can pick on Hollywood. We can pick on Netflix. We can let you listen. I want you to understand something. I'm not going to quit saying these things, but I get it. If you're not there, if you're still like your show on Netflix, I get it. I'm not trying to. It wasn't that long ago I was watching Netflix. I'm not trying to act like I've arrived and that I'm holier than thou. That's not what I'm trying to say. But when I'm feeding my... Listen, when every image has a lesbian or a homosexual relationship in it, it's a problem. Amen. The world is trying to convince us that that's okay. I'm here to tell you the Word of God says that it's not. The Word of God is very clear. Homosexuality, transgenderism is against the will of God and the world is trying to convince us that that is normal behavior and that we're abnormal for believing that it's not. And if you watch enough Netflix, every single show you watch now has a homosexual relationship in it. And do you think that that doesn't affect you? And if it's not that, everybody's hopping in the sack with one another. Everybody's sleeping with one another. And the music that we listen to, I don't know. What's the... What, 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 I was going to ask y'all what y'all's favorite song on the radio. I don't, because I don't, I don't know. Huh? It's not a good idea. Oh, yeah. Okay, I know it's probably not a good idea to know the number one song on the radio either. Yeah, well, I don't know. They had some bad ones. The last time I asked that question. 
I'm not even gonna say who did it. Because then y'all know the song and I don't even want to bring it up. Alright, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed, don't be fashioned by the world. Do you believe that if you expose yourself to those things enough, that it'll start to fashion your way of thinking? Yes, yes. Um, I'm trying to remember, you know. Because look, when I was growing up too, you know, you think country music's safe. You think that's not as bad as rock and roll, but, you know, I remember Hank Williams Jr. It's just a family tradition. So if I listen to that enough times, I'm going to be like, ah, why, you, hey, why you drink? Why you smoke? Why you roll dope? Oh, it's just a family tradition. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what everybody did. So that's what we do. No. I got a new family. Amen. I got a new tradition. Amen. I got a new father. Hallelujah. I got a new brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's a new family tradition. And the new life is that we are not conformed or fashioned after the world, but that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we're going to learn that in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, let's worship the Lord. Amen. For a little bit tonight before we go. But